94.3 The Dude is very grateful to our men and women in uniform. We're proud to recognize local members of our military by turning the spotlight on them right now in our Soldier Salute. I'm your host, United States Marine Corps veteran Ethan Stitch Gardner, and on today's Soldier Salute, I was honored to be invited onto Fort Jackson to interview Garrison Commander Colonel John Hankins. Colonel Hankins, thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you so much for your service. Tell me a little bit about yourself, your road of 25 years of service to the United States Army. Uh, Ethan, thanks for the opportunity, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to come in today. I am a native of the Boot Hill part of southeast Missouri. I grew up on a cotton and soybean farm with my family there until we went bankrupt in 1986, which was my freshman year of college. After that, my uh, dad took a job as a janitor and a bus driver at a local high school that he graduated from. From there, I was able to complete college, and upon completing college, College. It was it was pretty difficult during that time to get a teaching degree in Missouri. I had a physical education degree and had coaching job offers, but a lot of teachers were tenured, so the teaching jobs were far and few between. And if you didn't know the right people or have the right family member serving on the school board, it was it was difficult to get a job at that time. So I had a lot of student loans coming due, and I enlisted under the student loan repayment program in 1994. I attended basic training in AIT here on Fort Jackson, and after leaving Fort Jackson to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, at the Army Special Operations Command, I applied for the officer candidate school and was picked up and went to school about 24 months later. Commissioned at Fort Benning and Officer Candidate School. Spent three years in Germany, Human Resources Officer in the Army. After that, I came back to Fort Bragg where I commanded a company in the 82nd Airborne Division. And then over the next 13 years, I spent nine years in the 82nd, uh, two more years in the Army Special Operations Command and a year at ForceCom, which is the Army Forces Command. After that, I was the Division G1 at 3rd Infantry Division at Fort Stewart, Georgia. After that time, I went to serve in D.C. and the Pentagon for the Secretary of the Army and the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Man Power Reserve Affairs Office. Following that, I attended the Army War College at the Eisenhower School with National Defense University and then went back to the Pentagon to the Joint Staff where I served as the commander for the Army element for all the Army personnel on the Joint Staff. And then in my second year, I served as Secretary Joint Staff. After that job, I was fortunate enough to be selected for a garrison command and then slated for Fort Jackson, South Carolina, which was my top choice. So not only were we fortunate enough to get picked up, but we were fortunate enough to be selected for what we as a family uh, wanted to be selected for. So it worked out great for us. You mentioned that you started here. You came to boot camp here at Fort Jackson. Has it been really fascinating to see the changes over the last 25 years here on base? It really, really has. Fort Jackson has changed dramatically. Training has changed dramatically. I remember, you know, during basic training and, and AIT, you know, our AIT training at that time as a 71 Lima, all we had to do was to be able to type a memo correctly at a certain rate of speed. And I did that on the first day. So I, I waxed floors and cut grass on the on AC. <laughs> P1 uh, on the front gate for the rest of AIT. So it, it's it's pretty phenomenal to see what the installation was like that time, and and to, to be able to come back some 24 years later and serve as the garrison commander and, and see the progress on the installation, the development and training, how much the installation has grown and adapted over time, and and also the Columbia community. Uh, I've been here for four opportunities of training in addition to the basic and AIT. I also attended the officer basic course for the adjutant general school. I'm mean also the captain's career course here on Fort Jackson on two different occasions. So it's great to have this opportunity to be here for a couple of years to actually get to learn and know the community of Columbia. Colonel Hankin, sir, thank you so much for having me on Fort Jackson today. Tell me why you decided at the age that you did to raise your hand and say, yes, take me, I will serve the United States Army. At the age of 25, when I graduated college, I had worked my way through college, and it was a difficult road, but finally making it to graduation with a degree in physical education and a minor in coaching, the, the teaching opportunities were, were very few. I had coaching opportunities based on the experiences that I had had and the success with other teams, but a lot of the physical education teachers were tenured, and so they were able to keep their jobs, and so there were coaching job opportunities where they offered $1,500 a sport with no benefits, but the teaching opportunities that offered you your full salary and benefits just weren't available and they were very difficult to come by. At that time I was engaged. Um, I had student loans coming due and, and wanted to be able to move on with my life and so I actually had talked to my younger brother who was in ROTC at the time at Southeast Missouri State and he had talked about the officer candidate school program and enlisting in the army, the student loan repayment program, things that I was unfamiliar with and so I also talked to a Air Force NCO who had served in the Air Force at church and uh, he said 
said he enjoyed the time that he had served and encouraged me to do so. And we had another gentleman who was retired, Lieutenant Colonel from the Army at church, talk to me about serving as well. And so I spoke to my fiance and we decided to go ahead and enlist in the military to move forward after we got married. And I went to the recruiter and had attended to enlist in the Air Force and their, their door was closed that day. So I went next door to the Army. <laughs> And uh, they Air Force should learn to keep that door open, shouldn't they? <laughs> That's right. That's my message to the recruiter. Never close your door open. So uh, I enlisted into the Army, and 60 days later, I was at basic training here at Fort Jackson. So I would say that opportunity and the conditions at the time were what led me to initially join. Of course, the idea of serving the nation is always there. But I, I would say the things that kept me in the military for 25 years are that realization that the Army rewards performance. Uh, if you perform, it really doesn't matter what you're background is or where you come from, they recognize performance and potential and they will promote you based on that. Talking to 25-year-old Mr. Hankins, did you ever think that walking into the recruiter's office was going to lead to being a colonel in the United States Army and being a garrison commander? Absolutely not. When I first enlisted, I, I expected to come in for four years, get my student loans paid off, and then to complete an additional degree in accounting so that I could apply for a master's in sports administration program and eventually become an athletic director at a university. So that was my goal or my plan at the time. But once I enlisted and had the opportunity to serve and went through officer candidate school and had those experiences, our family really enjoyed the Army culture. Um, I'm, I love what I do every day. I'm passionate about what I do every day and so I, I just really couldn't see myself doing anything else at that time so we, we stayed in for the long haul. Colonel Hankins thanks so much for having me here thank you so much for your service garrison commander of Fort Jackson earlier we talked about fellowship camaraderie and the brotherhood that the United States military brings was that a powerful force that has kept you in the United States Army for so long, prospering throughout your time here? You know, Ethan, I'd have to say that, that those type of relationships are the primary reason that I remained in the military and continued to serve. Not only the, the passion and the return and the, you know that you get for having served and, and helped a, a service member, which means helping their family on a daily basis. Everything that we do on a daily basis touches somebody some way. And to me, that's very meaningful and very rewarding to have that opportunity to do that. Alongside, if I were to talk about the culture of the Army. We come from all walks of life. They come from every state in the nation. They come from every type of culture, every social economic background, every type of religious background. So there are a lot of dynamics that, that come into the Army from a lot of different avenues. And we have a common set of values that we use to shape the culture of the Army that we leverage to inculcate and bring all those different people from all these different walks of life together so that we have that commonality and that we have a shared focus and a shared set of values that kind of builds and bonds the relationships that we have with one another. I think through the continued training that we do with one another on a daily basis helps further instill that and build those relationships. And then for those that we don't serve every day, I think that the passion that, that we as leaders and that our service members who have different skills and different jobs that they perform in the Army every single day, all of the things that they do, no matter what your MOS is, the majority of our MOSs are all service MOSs, whether it's medical, whether it's personnel, whether it's it's legal, all those different things work together to support and build that sense of community with all the folks that are serving in our military to include their families and their dependents. Colonel Hankins, thanks so much for having me here on Fort Jackson today. You're the garrison commander for Fort Jackson. Not a whole lot of people out there know what that job entails. Tell me a little bit about the task list of a fort's garrison commander. Ethan, as a garrison commander, we wear multiple hats. We wear the hat of mayor, we wear the hat of city manager, and then also we have a legal authority hat when it comes to the Uniform Code of Military Justice and enforcing our legal standards on the population that resides on Fort Jackson to include the soldiers that are assigned to our organization. We manage a lot of different faucets on Fort Jackson. We have various things that are similar to what you would see in any city throughout the United States to include our Department of Public Works, which is our utilities and our military construction and facilities that you see on post. The obvious that also includes all of the, the roads and the power lines and the energy systems that you see on Fort Jackson. We also are responsible for the protection and the safety and the security of Fort Jackson, which has to do with our control points and our gate access. It also has to do with our police force that we have on Fort Jackson that ensures the security and that people are obeying the laws and, uh, that we have here on Fort Jackson in, in terms of the same issues that 
HMIC off the installation. We also have our emergency services, which are our ambulance and our fire services, and with our fire department being a nationally recognized fire department for small fire departments here on Fort Jackson, so they do a phenomenal job with that. We have our human and social services, which they provide all of the personnel support to those service members and civilians who are working on Fort Jackson on a daily basis to meet their administrative needs. They also have an Army Community Service Agency, which provides support and help in terms of educational opportunities, transitioning opportunities to employment outside the military once they leave the military, and also building those partnerships with Columbia Community opportunities to help provide jobs and create opportunities for the service members here on Fort Jackson. And so in learning all the things that we do, my ability to, one, integrate them to ensure the delivery of all of our services to the patrons that would consume them, but also to look long term to see how we need to adapt and posture ourselves five and 10 years and 15 years out from now so that we stay in line with Army priorities. We modernize Fort Jackson, and at the same time, we continue to sustain and build that relationship with Columbia. Last question, Colonel. Would you like to put a star on one day? Is that a dream of yours? Is that something that you want to see happen in your life? I have never asked for an opportunity. I have always waited for the Army to tell me what that next opportunity is going to be. I don't come to work every day looking for a star, and I have no illusions of grandeur uh, that a star is coming my way. But I have no I have no immediate goals to retire. I am not looking for the next promotion. I enjoy what I do serving soldiers in this capacity every single day, and, and I've never questioned it. I've only saluted the flagpole and moved on to the next objective. So that, that will be my goal uh, in this capacity to maximize the opportunity that the Army has afforded me to, to have working with the incredible folks that we have here on Fort Jackson. And then when that time is done, my, my intent is whatever the Army asks me to do next to go and do that to the best of my ability. Thanks for joining us in our Soldier Salute, presented by Little Pig's Barbecue. Serving Columbia since 1963 with that bodacious buffet. And Palmetto State Armory, American made for life. And Franklin Equipment, rent, buy, rely. And Atkins Law Firm Workers' Comp Attorneys, who you hire matters.